You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. All right, welcome back everybody to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. It is so wonderful to be here with everyone on this third night of Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah to everyone. I hope everyone has a Hanukkah that is uplifting, that is spiritual, connected, and filled with light. Hashem should allow our light to shine forth. Every person has a tremendous light within them. Hashem should help that light shine forth. This is the finale of the series that we've been learning so diligently on the work of bitachon. Bitachon means trust in Hashem. Having bitachon means that you are letting go and allowing Hashem to run the world for you, that you don't have to be in control of everything. So previously, we learned that the last eight weeks, we've learned from the amazing book of Rabbi Lazer Brody, the book of Bitachon, all of the details to this very point, to this last chapter that we'll be doing together, which is chapter six, the best boss. And when I was preparing for tonight's class and going through Rabbi Brody's book, uh, I have a lot to talk about. So let's get, let's get started. Let's jump right in. In our previous chapter, we learned that attaining true trust in Hashem necessitates infusing bitachon in all three levels of our soul, the neshama, the ruach, and the nefesh, which correspond to thought, speech, and deed. We saw that learning and observation are the two ways that internalize bitachon on the neshama, or thought level, while praying, and especially personal prayer, deepens our bitachon on the ruach, our speech level. This chapter will now show us how one can successfully internalize bitachon on the level of nefesh, which is the way of our deeds. One's level of bitachon in deeds has a profound effect on making an adequate and pleasurable income. So now we're going to see one of the most important parts of bitachon. It relates to tithing, to ma'aser. Nothing so powerfully infuses the nefesh with bitachon as the mitzvah of ma'aser does, tithing one's income and giving the money to a worthy cause. The act of tithing shows that a person trusts Hashem for his or her income and therefore is not afraid of fulfilling Hashem's commandment of giving a tithe. The following story from the Medrash Tanchuma is a superb illustration of bitachon in deed, in action, showing how profoundly tithing and the level of bitachon in nefesh directly affect one's income. During the times of the Second Holy Temple in Jerusalem, there was a pious farmer whose field consistently produced a thousand bushels of wheat. Year after year, immediately after harvesting the crop, the farmer set aside a full tenth of the produce as ma'aser, as a tithe. Before doing anything else with the balance of, of his crops, he sent these hundred bushels of wheat to the Holy Temple as sustenance for the Levites who served Hashem in the Holy Temple. Now we know that the Levites did not get an inheritance from the land. The Levites were the rabbis, they were the scholars, and they were also the kohanim. The Kohanim come from the tribe of Levi, and they were supported by the gifts that were given to the temple. And that was they, they didn't get again; they didn't have a, a an inheritance of the land. So every community and every one of the other tribes gave them, so that they have the rabbis living amongst them. So the tribe of Binyamin gave them, and the tribe of Issachar gave them, and the tribe of Yehuda gave them. Every tribe gave Levi a portion of their land so that the rabbis can have a place to live in their midst. After that was done, he was left with his balance of 900 bushels of, of grain, which provided an adequate income for his entire coming year, in addition to a little extra for savings. As such, his savings became progressively more and more as the years passed. The farmer grew old and his time to depart the physical world approached. He summoned his only son to his bedside and said, My dear son, 
I have lived a very good life in accordance with the commandments of our Holy Torah. Whatever I possess will now be yours to do as you please. One thing I will advise you. Our land produces 1,000 bushels a year. Never, ever fail to tithe from it. If you give Maaser faithfully, the land will not disappoint you. The first harvest of the young man on his own yielded a thousand bushels of wheat, as before. The son faithfully gave his tithe, and one hundred bushels were given, just as his father always had done. A year transpired, and once again the field yielded a bumper crop of a thousand bushels. This time, the venom of greed and stinginess began to penetrate the young man's soul. What? Am I crazy? Why should I give away an enormous sum of some of a hundred bushels to the Levites in the temple? Let them suffice with ninety. Sure enough, the following year's yield would no longer be one thousand, but only nine hundred. Seeing that his income decreased, the young farmer decided to create an austerity plan. The first victim was the tithe. Therefore, after his third harvest on his own, he only gave 80 bushels to the needy Levites. As if on heavenly cue, his fourth harvest yielded only 800 bushels. Instead of heeding the divine message that his wheat field was conveying to him, he angrily continued reducing his maaser until it reached the point where the yield of his tenth harvest was a mere only 100 bushels, which during his father's lifetime was only the tithe. The above story illustrates, and this is a true story from the Midrash, illustrates an amazing deep-seated spiritual principle on the benefits of working for Hashem as a reliable trustee administering divine affairs. Let's see how this works step by step. Now, before we continue with the story, I want to share with you an incredible story that I heard from a very, very big philanthropist who lived in Jerusalem. And he said that at the beginning of every year, he decided how much money he wanted to make. And he would give commitments and pledges to 10% of that amount immediately. And he said, whatever I gave a tithe of is what I earned throughout the year. So if you wanted to make a million dollars, he immediately committed a hundred thousand dollars to charity. And that way God had to fulfill the other 900 or the actual full million. Imagine that, right? Our sages tell us that the tithe that we give is almost like a prophecy of what we're going to make. You're being stingy on your tithe. You're not going to make that money. You're not going to make that money. You hear that, Dave? It's an unbelievable thing. It's an unbelievable thing. When a person doesn't realize that God, how does it really work? The way Rabbi Brody is going to explain this here in a minute, but the way it really works is that God is, was supposed to give us 900. You know why he gave us, he gave us a thousand? Because he says, oh, I want to see if I can trust you to be my distributor out in the world. I'm going to give you an extra hundred. You give it out for me. Instead, he says, no, no, this is mine. This is mine. I'm going to keep this for myself. I have some more incredible stories we'll see in a few minutes. I want to get a group of people. We're going to commit and try it together to see whether or not such a thing works. And you can test God on this, and we'll see in a minute a verse from Malachi, which is my Haftorah that I read for my Bar Mitzvah, and it says, Uvachanuni so you can test me on this. You can't generally test God on anything. You're allowed to test God. This is one of the few times where you're allowed to test God. The Torah commands, You shall tithe, you shall tithe your grain harvest, the yield of the field year after year. Tithe, you shall tithe, emphasizes that Maaser is not an occasional commandment to do once, and not just for farmers. Any money goods, or monetary equivalent that a person receives or earns must be tithed. If a person acts accordingly, our sages not only promise that he or she will have an adequate income, but 
will become rich as well. Financial success? Tithe properly and you're guaranteed financial success. I don't like to call it successful people because most people who have extraordinary amount of money usually don't have a lot of other success in their life. They can't maintain relationships. They can't maintain many other things. They probably, you know, have never put their children to sleep. That's not my definition of success, which is why I try to, I call it financial success. That, 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 yes. But I wouldn't call it successful people. You know, it's like, oh, very successful. He's on his fourth wife. And, and you know what I mean? It's like, that's not, okay. Better than our sages promise is Hashem's own promise. Hayikva Adam Elohim. Okay, that's from I have Torah. Ought man to defraud God? Yet yeah, you are defrauding me, God says. And you ask, how have we been defrauding you? In tithe and contribution. And the verse continues. You are suffering under a curse, yet you go on defrauding me, the whole nation of you. This is the verse. Pay attention carefully. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse and let there be food in my house. And thus... Put me to the test. You can test me. See the Lord of hosts. I will surely open the floodgates of the sky for you and pour down blessings on you. Okay, that's the verse in Malachi, chapter 3, verses 8, 9, and 10. Commenting on this passage, the holy Tanaic uh, sage, the Amora, Rami Barhama, says that the blessing is so big that your lips will be warned from telling Hashem enough, enough. The Yivlu Sifsochsechem Milomar Dai. Ad Yivlu, your, your lips are going to become worn by saying Hashem enough. That's the blessing that's going to come your way. We have Yitzchak Arama encapsulates the entire message of this chapter in one sentence. The Torah uses the double language of tithe you shall tithe to teach that every repeated worldly act of tithing deepens one's spiritual acquisition of bitachon in the soul. In other words, by tithing over and over again, a person progressively internalizes deeper trust in Hashem. As we see, we need not surmise that tithing is conducive to income, for we see that explicit promises throughout the oral and written Torah. Rabbi Yahushua says that the recipient of the tithe does more for the donor than the donor does for the recipient. What does this mean? You hear that? The recipient does more for the donor than the donor does for the recipient. How remarkable is that? Rabbi David Taub explains that if Hashem wants a worthy beneficiary to receive $10, he will give a worthy benefactor $100. For the latter will surely be a faithful trustee in passing the money, grain, or goods into the intended recipient. So that means that Hashem is sending a person of success. The, the Torah tells us, who does Hashem send blessing to? Someone who's worthy of blessing. Who gets the blessing? Someone who's worthy of blessing. Hashem sends a messenger that is a worthy messenger. Very important. Hashem doesn't want just anybody. He wants a worthy messenger. I'll share with you a story. There is a very, very wealthy philanthropist who lives in L.A. His name is Mr. Rechnitz. Shlomo Yehuda Rechnitz. And he gives an enormous, enormous amount of charity to every yeshiva, to every kolo that asks. And he has people lining up outside his house, around the block every Saturday night. He sees people and he gives and gives and gives unbelievable amounts, you know, to the mir yeshiva and to, you name the yeshiva, he's giving enormous sums of money. 
So he once spoke at the gala of, I believe it was the Mir Yeshiva in England. And he said the following story. He goes around and he meets with many, many sages, many rabbis, many Torah scholars, many Kabbalistic characters, and he asks them questions. And one of the questions that he was asking them constantly was, we know that there's a blessing that those who give will be rewarded to be able to give more. Those who tithe will be able to tithe more because there'll be so much blessing, so much you know, abundance will come their way by their tithe. He says, but I know many, many, many people who tithe very, very meticulously and they lose their job, they lose their business, they go bankrupt. I've seen so many stories, he says. And he goes from rabbi to rabbi asking, how do we understand this, that people who do tithe and are so committed are not receiving their, quote, reward as promised. See, he said, I offer a an idea and the rabbis love it. And this is his idea that he said. Imagine if you hire someone to be the manager for your philanthropy foundation. So you have the, you know, the David and Susan foundation. And now you say, you know what, rabbi, can you manage our foundation? We want you to give out the money for us. We don't want to be busy with who got, gets what and every single a proposal and every single request, you take care of it so you can get, you know, give out all that hundreds of millions of dollars. You can give it us off, on, give it out on our behalf. So imagine a year later you call me and you say, okay, let's go through the books here. You call and go through the books and you see that I'm favoring the schools that my children get into and I'm favoring, oh, you'll accept my kid? Okay, you'll get some extra money. Right, you're favoring my oh my synagogue. You'll get some extra money, right? Oh, I don't like the style of this place. I'm not giving them money. I don't like the style of that place. I'm not giving them money. It's not my style. So what would you do? What would you say? You say that that's not acceptable. What do you mean? I didn't give you this responsibility for you to get your own benefit for it. I asked you to give it out to all good causes, not only the ones you believe in, right? You'd say, you know what? I'm pulling it away from you. Whose money is it? It's Hashem's money. Hashem is giving us that opportunity to give out his money. And then we say, you know what? This cause I don't like. I'm not doing this. This one I like. I'll give it to them, right? This one is my synagogue. I'm going to give it to them. This one is, he says, a person who truly is giving to tithe on Hashem's behalf Gives to everybody. You don't have to give a lot to everybody. But anybody who asks, you give. And he says, that's what he, he says, the rabbis liked his answer. Because you have to understand the responsibility is not only to give, oh, I'll give my synagogue and get a big plaque over there. Right? That's not what it's about. What's about the guy next door? What's about that other charity down the block? What's about that? No, I don't, I don't go to that synagogue. I don't get a, I'm not giving them. I don't give to my children. Go, don't go to that school. They're not getting any money from me. But we give to everyone. The Torah tells us, "Kol haposhet yad nosenlo." Anyone, anyone who asks, we give. Anyone who asks, and that, by the way, doesn't only mean our favorite institutions. I make it my business that any single institution that asks me. I give. It doesn't necessitate a large donation, but I give something. Why? Because we want to be valued distributors of Hashem's money. It's Hashem's money. It's not our money. So if we see over here what, what he says, that if Hashem wants a worthy beneficiary to receive $10, he will give a worthy benefactor $100, for the latter will surely be a faithful trustee in passing the money, grain, or goods onto the intended recipient. That's the responsibility we have. And that's the tithe that we're meant to give from all of our earnings. 
is to give it as recognizing this is not mine. I once, I've said this story before, I once got a phone call from a supporter of Torch. He says to me, Rabbi, I left you a check in the office. Go pick it up. This is before the end of a year, I believe it was. I said to him, thank you so much. You know, this is not, you know, it's not, not, it's not like it wasn't expected. This is like, this is Rabbi, if it was my money, you wouldn't see a dime. But it's Hashem's money. So enjoy it. And I thought it was such a, a brilliant recognition. It was a brilliant recognition that the money doesn't belong to us. I've been blessed. It's not my money. Take it. It's God's money. That's the way we should feel about the charity that we give. Now, tithing is different than charity because tithing doesn't belong to us. Charity is of that 90% that's remaining. That is charity. Uh, a good friend of mine in New York taught me this idea. I do, I do this myself where he has his main account and then he has Hashem's account. And for every dollar he deposits into his account, paycheck, whatever it is, he immediately takes 10% and puts it into Hashem's account. That's Hashem's money. I'm distributing it for him, but it's not my money. It's Hashem's money. I thought it's a very nice idea. So I copied him. Before Moses and David became the leaders of Israel, Hashem's flock, Hashem tested them as shepherds. Once they proved how faithful they were in tending to the sheep, they ultimately became the shepherds of Hashem's flock. This teaches us that Hashem tests a person on a small scale before he tests a person on a large scale. Tithing is no exception from this rule. Most people will gleefully declare that they are more than willing to give a million dollars to charity if Hashem gives them 10 million. Meanwhile, Hashem sees that they have dozens of excuses for not tithing what they currently have. I remember when they had the first like mega, mega, mega million dollar lottery. It was like like 550 million at the time was the, it was the largest. And it was like since we've had over a billion dollars, right? But so I remember it was Friday night. I went around the table and we asked the following question. If you won that $550 million, what would you do with it? And we went around the table. It's probably 50, 60 people there. And every person except for one said, oh, I'd give half the torch. I give 10% the torch. And they said, oh, I'll give to charity. I'll give to this. I'll give to that. People were giving, giving like it's water. People were pledging what they would give. And then one guy, probably the only guy who said the truth, said, I wouldn't give a dime to anybody. I'd buy myself a house in Mexico. I'd buy myself a house in Paris. I'd buy myself a house, right? And he was talking about what, what he would do. And then he turned to everybody else. And he said, which one of you are right now giving 10% of what you make? You think it's going to be easier when you have $550 million? Then it's going to be easier to give 10%? You got to give 10% now. And that's the truth. We think, oh, I'm going to have so much money, I'll be able to give 10%. It's not a big deal because <laughs> if I have $10 million, I'll give a million easy. It's not a problem. I'll have $9 million left. That's not the way it works. Giving is a muscle. And the muscle of letting go and letting Hashem. Let go and let God. Giving means I'm ready to let go of what I think is mine and show that it's Hashem's. That's what giving is. And that's the exercise of tithing that we do every single time money comes into our hands. Like, how do I give away Hashem's portion? I want to give it away to a good cause. Whatever that cause may be, give it away. So I'll tell you like this. I had a guy who called me once. He says, Rabbi, I need to meet with you. Okay, no problem. We meet at a Starbucks, and I remember this as clear as day. He says to me, Rabbi, I'm about to close a deal. If I close this deal, I will give you $50,000. He says, but I want to, he says, I want the deal to close. So I'm making that commitment right now, and I want to shake on it. I'm making a pledge that if the deal closes, I'm giving you $50,000. So I'm right there. I give him my hand and we shake and l'chaim and we drink our coffee and we, you know, how's the wife? How's the kids? Great. He got it off his, 
chest, and now he's going to close the deal. Sure enough, I don't hear from the guy. It's like a month or two or three later, I try reaching him. How's that? Did it go? I don't hear anything back. Finally, I meet him. I'm like, well, you know, whatever happened with that deal? He says, Rabbi, you're not going to believe it. The deal closed, but I decided I'm going to invest the money for you. I'll just tell you that right now it's more than 10 years later and I didn't see a penny. So that's the, you know, the, 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 and, and you know what? I'm not upset about it one bit. I'm really not because money doesn't come from him. Money doesn't come from any donor. Money comes from Hashem. And he wasn't a worthy, he wasn't a worthy benefactor to be able to be a vessel to give to a cause as holy as torch. What is torch? Torch is only about Torah. Torah, Torah, Torah. The millions and millions of hours that people are learning Torah with torch. That's no gimmicks. There's no gimmicks. There's no fluff here. It's straight Torah. That's what torch does. Teaching and learning authentic, real Torah experiences. So now we continue. Once a person establishes himself as a faithful trustee, tithing his or her current income, Hashem will accord them the opportunity of becoming a faithful trustee in the next higher level. In brief, he or she who faithfully gives 10 of the 100 that Hashem entrusts them with will eventually give 100 of the 1,000 that Hashem entrusts them with and gradually 1,000 of the 10,000 and so forth. The opposite dynamics also hold true as we learn from the Midrash's account of the pious farmer and his less pious son. There are those who claim that they tithe yet fail to see the blessing. There is no such thing. On close inspection, one will surely discover that they haven't tithed all sources of income or else have deducted certain expenses from what should be tithed on an halachically unauthorized manner. To discern what is authorized and what is not, one should consult with a knowledgeable bona fide rabbi and spiritual leader. Some of our sages say that the blessing in that verse that we spoke about, greater than enough in that blessing, in that verse, does not refer to a quantitative opulence, but means that whatever Hashem gives the faithful trustee will be more than enough for that person. In other words, they will be blessed with satiation. In stark contrast, King Solomon says, He who loves money will never be satiated with money. And in other words, they'll never have enough. It's like the difference between Jacob and Esau, right? Yaakov says, I've got it all. What does Esau say? Yeshli Rav, I have a lot, but I still want more. There's always room for more. So wealth and prestige. The Yerushalmi Talmud interprets, you shall tithe, you shall tithe as a commandment to give two tithes. In other words, a fifth of one's income to charity, which means 20%, not 10%. Rav Achai Gon says that nothing is so powerful in generating wealth as giving a chomesh, one-fifth. In his book, Avas Chesed the Chaim adopts the opinion of the Vilna Gon that if a person lives in a place where there are many needy such as poor widows and orphans, he is required to give the fifth of his income to charity. Notwithstanding, many of our sages say that the giving of a fifth is not something that the average person should attempt, for it is only for the select few. An intermediate opinion says that the chomesh, the 20%, is fine for a windfall, but not for a person's basic income. At any rate, halacha forbids giving more than a fifth. Actually, the halacha said, the Talmud says, more than a, more than a third. You should not give more than a third. But either way, he brings over here from the Shulchan Aruch, uh, Kuf Mem Tes, that one should not give more than a fifth. One thing is for sure. If a person earns the title of faithful trustee by tithing, then he or she will surely attain a loftier status above by giving a fifth. Revad Yosef, Chacham Ovadia, who was the leader of the Sephardic people for the last hundred years, writes that while tithing is a basic obligation, Chomish is a supreme fulfillment of the mitzvah. He also cites the tour, who's one of the uh, commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, 
who promises that the giver not only will never suffer a lack of funds, but will attain wealth and prestige. The more you give, the more Hashem gives. Mida keneged mida. An act for an act. Well, it, well, God reacts in a reflection of our action. And the more we bring God into our lives, the more God is in our lives. The more we give, the more God gives. So I'll tell you, I recently had a story where an individual was really financially harmed by his former employer. And he called me for advice. What do I do? So I told him. I said, you have two options. The first option is you take him, you hire a good lawyer, and you take him to court or to bet din, and you sue him, and you'll make a lot of money. Or you just let it go, and Hashem will repay you another way for your lost funds, for your lost money. I said, but let me tell you the benefit of way number one and the benefit of way number two. Way number one will cause you three years of heartache. And you may never live through it because you'll have so much heartache with all of the fighting, with all of the arguments, with all of the yelling, screaming, with all of the the passion that goes into these arguments. Or you have option two. And option two, you'll be very healthy. And you'll be able to rely on Hashem. And I guarantee you that if you choose the way of Peace, the way of just letting it go, the repayment will be much more pleasurable. It's your choice. Do you want the blessing? If you want the blessing, let the blessing come in. Let the blessing live in your in your midst, and more blessing will come. And he picked the second choice. I'm very happy. Let's now take everything we have learned so far in this chapter and practically apply it to our daily lives. By seeing the tangible benefits of giving ma'aser or chomesh, either 10% or 20%, we reinforce our bitachon, our trust in Hashem, in a phenomenal manner. Nothing strengthens our emuna like seeing the Torah come alive in our own lives. The Midrash about the farmer and his son teaches us several poignant lessons. First, A person's attitude profoundly influences behavior. This is an amazing teaching. What you do influences you. The way in which you dress influences you. You know, sometimes you decide you're not going to get dressed up. So, you know, and that becomes like a, you know, a not dressed up day. But sometimes you decide you're going to get dressed up. And you get dressed up and your whole day is a different day because of it. What is that? That's just clothes. But imagine now attitude. Imagine in the words that we use, how well we can, how much we can influence our day by using kinder words. We can make our lives so much more special by allowing these opportunities to come our way. It's really up to us to allow for this to come into our lives. A person's attitude profoundly influences behavior. The pious farmer saw himself as working for Hashem. Therefore, he gladly, readily, and easily tithed his harvest, making sure that the Levites in the Holy Temple received their share even before he took care of his own share. The pious farmer's attitude was that Hashem is the proprietor and he is the worker. Intrinsically, as the farmer well knew, a field like his, according to nature, was only capable of yielding a hundred bushels of wheat annually. But by placing his assets in Hashem's hands, the one hundred bushels became his maser, his tithe, and Hashem let him have nine hundred bushels, for the field yielded ten times more than expected. Don't be surprised. Ten times more than natural is not so remarkable when we think that Isaac's field yielded a hundred times more than his neighbor's equivalent fields. The pious farmer's son, as opposed to his father, construed that he was working for himself. He therefore begrudged giving anything away, much less tithe, because he thought that he was giving away his own assets. The difference here is the father knew it wasn't his to begin with. 
they had no problem giving it. But here the son says, this is mine. Why am I giving away from mine? In summary, the son thought that he was working for himself. Therefore, his income was confined to the limitations of nature. The father saw himself as working for Hashem, and since Hashem defies and overrides nature, so did the farmer's fields. Each one of us, too, can work for Hashem. If our source of income, our profession, our business, our job, our farm, or whatever it may be, is our own, maybe it will succeed and maybe not. But it's liable to be solely limited to natural circumstances. But if we turn our endeavors over to Hashem, it must succeed. This is Hashem's. It's His business. Here is how to turn your business occupation or source of income into Hashem's corporation. Decide from this moment on that it belongs to Hashem and you are working for Him as His chief operating officer. You're just the chief operating officer in Hashem's corp- in, in, in the corporation. Name it for your family. Hashem is a fantastic employer and is letting you keep 90% of the income. As COO and faithful trustee, you readily give your tithe to the very best causes you can find. Just as one would consult with a financial advisor in making the best investment, it's best to consult a trustworthy rabbi and spiritual guide for guidance in making the best use of Hashem's funds. Suppose someone yearns to be a great philanthropist and faithful trustee who is entrusted with transferring tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars and more to Hashem's worthy recipients. First, he or she must begin by readily and willingly give their tithes. Now, they want to grow. I don't suggest that anyone jump from 10% maaser tithe to chomesh to 20% in one leap. That's dangerous. And a person could have a crash landing, especially when he or she attempts a feat that is beyond their current spiritual level. Gradual growth is a key phrase. Here is a plan that I have suggested to many people and they've seen big success. It's a gradual spiritual corporate growth plan and it operates like levels of income tax. The more you earn, the more you give. Sit down and make an estimate of your monthly needs. This is the amount that covers your expenses, but without the ability to save any money. There's no need to be stingy, but don't go to the opposite extreme and include a Bermuda vacation. Enable yourself to put fine food on your Shabbos table and festival table and to send your children to the finest schools. Allow yourself whatever you need to clothe your family and fulfill Hashem's other mitzvahs in a respectable manner, including new clothes for Passover and the high holidays. You can include your family's vacation too. Be reasonable, but not extravagant. Don't forget average home maintenance and health expenses. In case you missed an item, add on another 10% to your final estimate of monthly needs to reach the final sum of your basic break-even budget. Let's suppose you arrive at the sum of $12,000 monthly. This is the money you need to cover your expenses. Now divide that sum by 0.9. You arrive at the sum of 13,333. This is the money you need before tithing. Now give Hashem the 10% that's His anyway which is $1,333, and you're left with $12,000 after tithing. Right? Makes sense? Let's now assume that you have proven yourself as a faithful trustee who readily and willingly channels funds to Hashem's designated recipients. And the Rambam in Mishnah Torah, chapter 10, Halacha 7 through 14 in the Laws of Charity, delineates the eight priorities in giving, Hashem sends you a windfall month and you make double your needs. You make 26666 before tithing. Now do as follows. Number one, on the amount of your basic needs, tithe as usual. Therefore, on the first $13,333, 
you'll be giving 10% or $1,333. As for the cream that Hashem is giving you beyond basic expenses and you yearn to be a big philanthropist, give 20%. Therefore, on the additional 13333, you'll be giving 20% or 2666. Consequently, according to our spiritual corporate growth plan, where your private financial affairs are now Hashem's corporation, you'll be giving 3999 on a total income before tithing of 26666 which is twice your monthly needs. Once a person is comfortably giving maaser on the basic needs part of the income and chomish on the bonus part of the income, he can easily grow into giving chomish on the entire income. So give 10% on the actual needs, but then you give 20% on everything that's above the needs. And that's just like a training mechanism. Now, here's the most important thing. When we're talking about being givers, it means being godly. Givers means you're being godly. Why? Because giving, just so that we understand, giving is an exercise. Giving is an exercise. The halacha says, that if a person can give a thousand dollars or give a thousand single dollars, which one should they do? Give one lump thousand dollar bill or give a thousand single dollar bills? The Rambam says to give a single thousand dollars is more valuable. Why? Because you're training that muscle to give, to give, to give, to give. You know what it means to be a giver for a thousand dollars that are going to someone else? You're exercising that muscle. And the more a person exercises that muscle, the more they become a giver. Of course, a partner will give God, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Hashem, think of Hashem. Hashem gives us and gives us and gives us nonstop, nonstop. Once a person is comfortable giving maaser on the basic needs and a chomish on the bonus part of the income, it can easily grow into giving a chomish, a fifth, on the entire income. Once a person has made every effort to internalize bitachon, trust in Hashem on the level of D, thereby filling the nefesh with bitachon, how does he or she know that they've succeeded? The answer is quite simple. They feel like a servant of the king. They feel like whatever they do is a way to serve the king and sanctify his holy name. Such an individual is not a mere servant of the king, but an ambassador who beautifully represents the king. There is a big difference between the servant's shining his own shoes and shining the king's shoes. For his own shoes, a $1 brush and a $1 tin of shoe polish will suffice, together with an old cloth or rag to bring those shoes to high shine. But, For the king, one needs fragrant oils from Italy and silk cloths from Japan and the finest Hungarian brushes, which together would cost hundreds of dollars. If the servant shines the king's shoes with such dedication that they always look like black onyx mirrors, then the king won't say a word if the servant uses the king's exquisite utensils to shine his own shoes. But if the servant is unfaithful and uses the king's exquisite utensils to shine his own shoes while neglecting the king's shoes, then he'll forfeit his privileges and possibly lose his position altogether. By the same token, when a person works for his own benefit, he or she will be be lucky to have the bare minimum, like the proverbial $1 tin of shoe polish. But, When they work with the intent of serving Hashem and fulfilling His commandments, he or she will ultimately have whatever they need. So I think that the lessons here are incredible. And the importance of us exercising this muscle of giving by, how do we give? By recognizing that we're just a vessel of Hashem. By recognizing that we are a 
conduit through which Hashem is sending blessing to the world. The Torah tells us that God gives good to the world through good. God finds those who are meritorious and those are the ones who he sends the merits through. Anybody could have done it. Yeah, but he sent it through you because you had merit. I want to share with you an incredible story. Rabbi Aaron Cutler, who passed away in the 50s, in the early 50s, started the Lakewood Yeshiva. And to start the Lakewood Yeshiva, you need a lot of money. It was the first major yeshiva in the United States, actually the second, I think Torah Vadas was first, and then came the Lakewood Yeshiva. And Ravara Kotla had a vision. Today you have uh, 6,000 yeshiva students learning all day in the, in the Lakewood Yeshiva. It's really incredible. He once went to a donor, and this is back in the early 50s. He went to a donor, and he solicited him a gift of $100,000, which at that time... I mean, to today's, today would be millions and millions of dollars. And the guy's like, yes, I'll do it. Uh, but I, I don't have my checks with me. I don't have a way to, to give you that kind of money right now. So maybe tomorrow I'll have the check and, and we'll, I'll get, get you the money. Sure enough, that night the guy passed away and Rabbi Cutler, after the guy passed away and he met with the family, he told him that the father had, you know, just a day earlier made this pledge. And they weren't, halachically, they were not obligated to fulfill that pledge. And he asked them if they would like to. To which they said, no, we're not interested in fulfilling his pledge. And Rav Aaron said that a very amazing thing. He says, Weiss we see from here. He didn't have the merit to give to this cause. Now, why didn't he have his check with him? Because Hashem didn't want him to be the giver for this. Meaning, the way Rabbi Cutler saw it, he wasn't upset. Our yeshiva is going to thrive. It's who has the merit to give to such a great cause. And those who have the merit to give to a Torah institution, Hashem is going to send the blessing through them. But for some reason, this guy didn't merit to have the blessing come through him. That's why he didn't give it. He didn't see it as a flaw in the, in the person. He just wasn't the vessel through which Hashem wanted that blessing to go to the yeshiva. We want to be a vessel through which we can be the giver for Hashem. We want to be the vessel through which the blessing from Hashem goes. The only way for that to happen is for us to have the relationship through trust in Hashem. When we're ready to let go and we're ready to see that Hashem is the guide of this world. Hashem is the director. He's the manufacturer. He's the king. He's the was, is, and will be of this world. We're ready to let go. Ah, oh, Hashem will carry us. He'll say here, Drop him some money. Drop them some money. Go. Give to my, to the needs of the world. Do you know what it says? It says that Hashem created. Why did Hashem create poor people? So that the wealthy people will have who to give money to. There was a group of millionaires who met with Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman. Rabbi Aaron Leib Shtemo was the leading Torah scholar. Just a few years ago, he passed away. And he came to the United States, and a group of millionaires met with him. And they said, you know, Rabbi, there are a lot of people who come to us for money. A lot of people. Don't you think there may be a little bit too many yeshivas? Too many yeshivas? Constantly we're being bombarded with one after another after another. So many causes, so many organizations. To which the rabbi responded, well... Don't you think there are maybe too many millionaires? And then he went on to explain, don't you realize the reason there are so many of you is so that you can support so many of them. Hashem created you as a wealthy, successful person so that you can support them. Hashem creates the, the refuah, the heal, before the illness. 
That's why if you, if you, if you notice in the Ashrei, it has the letters of the Aleph Bet, the Aleph Bet, Gimel, Ashrei Yoshere Techab, Bechol Yom Avachecha, each one, except one letter, one letter is missing, is the letter Nun. The letter Nun is missing. You know why? Because what does the Nun stand for? Nofel. He is downtrodden. He who is impoverished. He who is poor. You know where Hashem put that? He put that inside the Somech. Somech is the, 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 the donor. So the Somech is the giver. Somech is the one who's the philanthropist. Hashem already created the healing before he created the illness. Hashem created the solution before he created the problem, so to speak. We think that it's our money. It's not our money. Hashem put it in our hands to see, are we going to be trustworthy to fulfill our mission? So my dear friends, in the conclusion of our incredible series, this is our ninth class on the topic of trusting God. It is so important for us to realize that every single thing that we have is a gift from Hashem. You have eyesight? Guess what? Don't count on it to be there tomorrow. It's a gift that Hashem is giving us every single day. Wake up in the morning and say, thank you, Hashem, for giving me the ability to see. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me the ability to walk. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me the ability to give charity. So let's take this incredible series that we've just learned together and let's utilize it every single day in our lives and internalize these messages and feel that closeness to Hashem, recognize that we're here on a mission. We're here to do a job. We're here to bring God into our lives. And when we're there with our sales team and we're going to the conference in Vegas and in Orlando, wherever it is that we go, you're representing the Almighty. And when people ask you, hey, that makes no sense. In Hashem's world, it does. Bring that light to the world. Let people see what it means to have a Jew who trusts in Hashem. Hashem should bless every single thing that we do. That we should have an incredible abundance of success, not only financial success, but more important, the connection to Hashem's success every single day of our lives. Amen. Thank you so much. Afrel Chen Hanukkah, beautiful Hanukkah to everybody. And I look forward to learning with you in two more weeks. We're going to resume on Tuesdays our Muster Master class at 7.30. You'll get an email about it shortly. Thank you so much, my dear friends. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.